Hello and welcome. This week we're going to be talking about learning theories. Again, theories about how we learn. We're going to cover three major ones. We're going to talk about classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and cognitive learning theory. Whenever we're talking about classical conditioning, we're going to be talking about stimulus and response. Those are the key words. For operant conditioning, we're going to be talking about rewards and punishments. And for cognitive learning, observation, modeling, imitation, and language. Okay, so when it comes to classical conditioning, this is the idea of stimulus and response, developing an association between two stimuli. We learn through stimulus and response. So for example, when we see a pizza, we all of a sudden get hungry and we start to salivate. That is an unconditioned response to an unconditioned stimuli, pizza. We biologically have a response to pizza or whatever food it is that you like when you are hungry and you begin to salivate. We've learned over time that pizza equals food. Therefore, when we see pizza, we start to get hungry and we start to salivate. That is the idea of being conditioned. We have been conditioned that when we see food, we learn to salivate. Okay, there's an association between two stimuli. Classical conditioning is something that introduces a neutral stimuli. Okay, this neutral stimuli can be a bell. It could be a metronome. It could be me going ding, dong, dang. Anything I want it to be. The goal of classical conditioning is to teach someone for them to learn to respond upon a neutral stimulus or a conditioned stimulus. So this is the idea of classical conditioning. A stimulus is an event or a situation that evokes a response. So again, when you see pizza, that's the stimulus. It revokes a response. However, if I train you that every time you're going to eat, I'm going to say ding dong dang. Every time I say ding dong dang, you will then have a response by getting hungry. If I can train you that ding dong dang means food. <laughs> Operant condition, again, is the idea that your response and consequences become associated with rewards and punishments. You do this, you get a reward. You do this and it's not right, you get punished. Cognitive learning, again, is all about observational learning. So classical conditioning is a theory based in behaviorism. Okay, and behaviorism is kind of a direct antipathy, 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 antipathy. Is that the opposite? Antipathetic? I have to think about what that proper word would be. But the opposite of the structuralist and functionalist views of trying to like seek out introspection and looking into the mind to understand people. Behaviorism is all about looking at stimulus and response to understand people. Okay, so again, this idea that John Watson encouraged disregarding introspection and mentalism, again, is this behaviorism kind of branched out and went in a different direction than classic structuralism and functionalism. And when you start to get into classical conditioning, the most popular of all the experiments that demonstrate this example is the Pavlov's dog experiment. Okay, and again, a dog, when it sees a steak, for example, begins to salivate. The steak is the unconditioned stimuli, and the response is the unconditioned response is the salivating. Okay? So food is an unconditioned stimuli associating with the dog salivating an unconditioned response. Now, Pavlov asks this question how do I get a dog to salivate maybe using something else? Can I teach that dog that when it hears a bell or a metronome, that food is coming? And so he asked this question, okay? So Pavlov did this. He had a stake, and he would hold the stake in front of the dog. The dog would respond by salivating, okay? So then here's what he did. Pavlov would ring a bell, then hold the stake up, then give the dog a stake, then ring the bell. Hold the stake up. Give the dog a stake. Then it would hide the stake, ring the bell, and he wanted to know, did the dog start to salivate? And the dog salivated. So this said that the dog, over time, learned that the bell means steak, which means food. 
So Pavlov figured out a way to get the dog to respond how it wanted to respond by using a conditioned stimulus like the bell. Think about it. If we all see food, the unconditioned stimulus, we start to get hungry and we start to salivate. But think about like in the old timey days when they had the dinner bells and they would ring the dinner bell. Over time, the people would respond to the dinner bell. When they heard the dinner bell, all of a sudden they would get hungry or they would start to salivate. Or if they started anticipating the dinner bell, and this is kind of where cognitive learning comes in. Then they start to salivate even a couple of minutes before that bell even rings because they know the bell is coming, for example. So the idea of the Pavlov's dog experiment is the idea that we learn through stimulus and response. The best idea of this is money. Money in itself does not provoke salivation. It doesn't provoke a response. However, you guys have learned over time that money gets you food, which then gets you what you need. So you have learned to associate money with food. Therefore, even though the money itself means nothing, when you see the money, you have to go, you go work and try to get the money so that you can go get yourself some food, for example. Okay? So some of the conditioning vocabulary, you have acquisition. When the dog finds out that the bell means food, that's when it's acquired the knowledge. It has learned that bell means food. Extinction happens like this. If I keep ringing the bell, but I never give the dog food, the dog eventually learns that the bell means nothing, and it stops salivating at the sound of the bell. Spontaneous recovery happens if I keep ringing the bell, don't give the dog anything, but then out of nowhere, I ring the bell and then give the dog a steak. All of a sudden, the dog will keep responding to the bell until, again, it realizes that, you know what, that was just a fluke incident. It's not going to get the steak again. Generalization is when I can ring all kinds of different bells and the dog, you know, here's one bell and it gets his hope up. Like, oh, that sounds kind of like the bell that I'm used to. Maybe that'll be the same one that gets me a steak. So it gets his hope up. So all of us have this idea about we can generalize information, categorize sounds of bells, sounds of drums, sounds of guitars, and kind of tell which is the one that means the food. Okay, discrimination is this ability for us to tell between stimuli. For example, if I play the key of G on a piano and I give the dog food, play key of G on the piano, give the dog food, but then I play the key of G, don't give it food, the dog will start to salivate, okay? And if I keep giving it food after I play G, it'll keep salivating the sound of G. However, if I just play the sound of F, the dog will learn over time that F on a piano doesn't sound like the G sound that gets it food, or E has a different sound than the G. So the dog will learn to dis discriminate between the, the C notes and E and F on a piano, for example. Okay? Operant conditioning is this idea that we learn through rewards and punishments. When we do something right, we get a reward. We continuously engage in that behavior. When we do something wrong, we get punished, and then the idea of punishment is to decrease a specific behavior. Okay? So classical conditioning is concerned with uh, stimulus and response. Operant conditioning is concerned with rewards and punishments. Okay? Now, rewards, another word for that is reinforcers, all of which increase behavior. Positive reinforcers, which means giving a stimulating, get like, Putting, presenting a stimulus as a reward increases behavior. Negative reinforcement is a very confused idea, but this is the idea that if I take away a stimulus, it'll reinforce behavior. So reinforcers, positive rewards are easy. Kid does something good on an exam, you give him a star. But that's positive reinforcement. But negative reinforcement's a little bit harder to understand. The best way to think about it is this. How do I, if I remove a stimuli, how does that increase behavior? Think about when you're sleeping and your alarm clock goes off. If you remove the stimuli, it reinforces your ability to be able to sleep longer. So again, turning off your alarm clock so you can sleep more is an idea, is an, is an area of negative reinforcement. So both positive and negative reinforcement increase behavior, okay? But punishment decreases behavior. The book talks about the operant chamber. 
Okay, the operant chamber is where they teach a mouse, for example, to climb up stairs and work its way up from the bottom floor to the top floor by doing different tasks. And the way the operant chamber works is this. The mouse fishes around, does a bunch of stuff, but then eventually it lands on a lever, and when it pulls the lever, food comes out. Okay, over time of trial and error, the mouse learns that every time it pulls a lever, food comes out. So, okay, what you do next is once it's figured out the first step, then you take away the reward at the first step and you put a reward at the second step. The mouse goes around, presses the lever, and then maybe it has to push another lever to get food again. And so on and so forth, all the way up the house. And by this way, by giving rewards each time it completes a task, the mouse gets faster and faster at being able to work its way up to the top of the house to get the rewards, demonstrating that it's learned. Okay? So again, positive reinforcement is presenting stimuli, okay? Negative reinforcement is taking away stimuli. Both of them increase behavior. Primary reinforcers are those for your biological needs, conditioned or secondary reinforcers like money, okay? Um, also motivate behavior, okay? Depending on the schedule dic that you present the rewards, dictates how fast and for how long somebody remembers something. So if you give them a reward every time they do something right, that's continuous. If you only do it part of the time, that's called partial or intermittent. The learning is a little bit slower, but extinction takes longer. A fixed ratio is like every fourth time they do something right, you give them a reward. Vario ratio, it's unpredictable. Okay. Fixed intervals after an amount of time has re uh, elapsed. So again, positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative rewards increase behavior. Punishment decreases behavior. Okay, Punishment is not as effective of reinforcement because reinforcement is teaching the behavior that you want. Punishment is just simply stopping all behaviors. Okay? So, biology and learning. Okay. Part of our learning, part of us figuring out how life works and understanding the social context, the social environment, is highly influenced by our biological structures. For example, we have the ability to do math and calculations and reflection because we have a developed outer cortex. A dog does not. Okay, We have the ability to use language to interact in our environment because we have a language acquisition device that all humans have. Language is perfectly a natural human phenomenon. Dogs have language, but not as in-depth as we do, for example. Okay, uh, Preparedness. What is your body actually capable of doing based upon your biology? Again, we can't fly. There's only so many things that we can actually do that we can learn to do. Okay? Um, all right. So cognitive learning. So you have cl classical conditioning, learning through stimulus and response, operant conditioning, learning through rewards and punishments or reinforcers and punishments. And then you have cognition and learning. Okay, your ability to use your brain, your ability to, you know, figure out the, the patterns of reality so life becomes predictable. You know what to expect. You learn to anticipate. You know when the mail is coming. Okay. Um, again, you learn to expect what is going to come, hence expectancy. You have this cognitive map on your brain. You kind of figure out like, you know, where everything is and how things work. And you start to code all your information. You code all your memories, your knowledge schemas. Then that helps you get through life, etc. Okay. Uh, latent learning is learning without reinforcement. A lot of it unconscious. A lot of it's just things you just enjoy doing. Uh, we model and imitate behavior and that is one way that we learn the behaviors we model and imitate the words that people are saying we model and imitate uh, the roles that people are playing we over time as we develop and get into like our teenage years we start to develop this theory of mind which is the idea that i can think about what somebody else is thinking like i'm imagining what's on their mind i become a you know aware of that you know, other people have their own minds and they might be thinking about me. OK, so again, we try to take on the roles of the others. We kind of think about where they're coming from and then that ends up influencing you. And so, again, your learning isn't just stimulus and response like an animal and rewards and punishments, which would motivate a rat. 
a lot of it is based upon your cognitions and the way you think and your drive and your motivation to learn and learning about things that you care about and things along those lines okay so it's a really good chapter i hope you guys like it you know we're just looking at the three basic theories of learning um, classical conditioning operant conditioning and cognitive learning okay and if you guys have any questions please email and thank you so much